Good morning, Newcom. I can't tell you um, how much Beth and I feel so happy to be able to join you. It's been four years since we've been in the Philippines. Uh, some of you might wonder, where, where have you been all this time? We, we live in Canada. We live in uh, a suburb of Toronto called Mississauga. And um, the, the temperature there, before we left, you know, Christmas for us was not a white Christmas. It was pretty warm. And then uh, before we left, it snowed. So then everything was covered in snow and ice. And then we, when after we left, I noticed I've been keeping track of the weather there. The weather there right now is pretty mild. It's only zero to minus two there. And, and so it feels that's mild. That feels like a refrigerator, right? It's, that's the temperature of a ref. Uh, and then now we're here. And I tell you, the other day, yesterday morning, I had a cup of coffee. I walked down the building or I took the elevator down, went outside, and I stayed outside drinking my coffee along, Ke along Edsa, near Quezon Avenue. And we were just sitting, I was sitting there, and I think, you know what? I could come back here and live here again. You know, I can. It's time for retirement, you know? Because I'm an, I'm an old man. I'm, I'm so old now, I can't believe it. It's been how many years? You're so old. Well, because, well, still. <laughs> You know, and this is, you know, I, I'm going to get to talk to you for a long time, so I'm going to give the mic over to my lovely wife, Ooh, the man, the servant, doesn't matter what you call her. Ayan, lovely, kasama kayo doon, mga lovely na yun. So, actually, thank you so much for preparing that. Uh, over the years, parang wow, talaga. Uh, grabe lahat pala ng ginaanan natin. Talagang uh, namamangha ako at nagpapasalamat ako sa Panginoon na you know, um, yung exposure na binigay niya sa amin, alam niyo ba noon, akala nila talaga ang laki-laki ng church natin. Yung mga tipong sa libo, dalawang libo, kasi palagi nakikita nila pag production, pag, you know, ang yung banda natin, yung production people, yun na nga, pag kebab fits, uh, yung, yung unang-unang Hillsong concert, uh, kami ang... Um, kami yung staff, kami yung, uh, yung director, yung ano, even sa promotions, tinulungan ko sila. Uh, so sabi ko, Lord, grabe, uh, you know, hindi natin ito mararating kasi exposure is everything. Um, kung hindi ka ma-expose, hindi ka lalago, hindi mo may kita na mas malaki yung, yung mundo, yung na, na pwede mo gawin pala ito, kung hindi ka na-expose. Kung nasa kwarto ka lang, and doon ka lang palagi, di ba? Parang ang lit ng mundo. But, but once na ma-expose ka, punta kang Baguio, pinapunta ka ng uh, Araneta Coliseum, meron, biglang, ay, from church to Araneta Coliseum, parang, wow, ang laki. You know, ay, kaya pa lang natin to, yung gano'n. So, I'm so grateful, and, and I'm so amazed, and I'm so impressed na, you know, with the production people, the band, you know, how you cut it to a T. Talagang nakuha nyo, in a joke, directly in a joke, and uh, Thank you so much. Pati naman yung mga hosts natin, talaga naman, uh, that's entertainment, ano? Para ay bulaga. Feeling ko, ay, you know, nasa ay bulaga ba ako? You know, so, I'm so amazed and I, I'm so thankful that ngayon, sabi ko nga palagi, hi, talaga pang nasa Pilipinas na tayo kasi feeling ko, since 2018, na ako pa naman, I work from home. So, talagang, is from malaking mundo, lumit yung mundo ko. <laughs> so feeling ko, ito, wait, nakalabas na naman tayo. So praise God, you know. His faithfulness, His, his love, His love. Sa akin, um, natutunan ko, kasi sa production, syempre, uh, nakita niyo naman how strict we are at, 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 the, at the start. Kasi to reach a certain level of excellence, you know, yun yung inanasahan ng Lord. Kasi sa advertising po ako, and sabi ko, anong tinuro sa akin ng Lord, you know, ang, ang mga nag-direct, sila Direct Freddy, si Roxanne Lapos, mga, yan yung mga mentors noon for directing. I just watch them from afar. Pero, yun na nga, sabi ko, anong natutunan ko, gusto ko ipasa sa, sa mga anak ninyo. Sabi ko, Lord, sige, let them come to us and we will teach them. So, ayan na, punta si na Haji, si na, you know, yung, yung sa production, talagang naturuan namin yan. So, yung level of excellence, iaakit natin para yung mundo, hindi ang tingin sa atin palagi, mababa, you know. 
Hindi, kaya natin tapatan. Dapat nga, lampasan pa natin eh. So, yan tayo. Anak tayo ng Diyos eh. Diba? Diba kasi? Diba kasi talaga ang anak ng Diyos? So, it's amazing. Ah, dami kong gusto ikwento pero kailangan sa pastor na. <laughs> Kung hindi, umusog ko yung oras. Anyway, thank you so much and I, I, I love seeing your your smiles kahit na nakamask. Kaya sa exam namin kanina, tanggalin mo yung mask. Hindi, hindi namin makita yung kagapuhan mo. Yung ganun. So, and uh, thank you for welcoming us again and thank you for, for being part of our family. Thank you so much. We love you. We miss you. Bye-bye. <laughs> It really, it really amazes me how far we've come as a spiritual family. I would never have thought back in 1998 when the Lord spoke to me. See, I, I have been uh, a church planter. I, I've been a pastor for 30 years, up to 2017. Today I tell people that I've retired from pastoring because I don't handle the church. Now I handle the leaders of churches. I handle... Leo, Joanne, don't handle them, but I love them and I mentor them and, and we share our lives together. And I would never have known, I would never have thought that we would have these kinds of friendships that would last this long. Leo was saying, Karina, he doesn't remember how long we've been together, but even before Newcom started, actually, I was trying to calculate it. We've been together for 28 years. 28 years. It's 19... 94, 1995, Kasama Kamesa, church, but it was the same church out of that that we birthed New Palm later on, years later. And that church actually sent me back to Canada to plant a church for them. So Beth and I packed up our kids and we went back to Canada and planted a church called Work for the World in Toronto. And we did that for one year. Then we came back in 1997, at the end of 1997, we came back here to do the 24 hours Celebrate Jesus, where Beth was directing. We left that church to another pastor. That church, by the way, is still thriving. It's still alive. It's going strong. I think there's around 200 members, 250 members in that church in Toronto. And we came back here, and it was in my heart, my heart, to plant another church. But I learned my lesson. I went through a very difficult time planting that church in Canada. There's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of egos involved there that I, with new people that I had not built a relationship with that I didn't know for many, many years. And it was very difficult. So, I said, Lord, I will not do anything unless you tell me what to do. You have to tell me when it's time to do this. Because I know what I want, but I want to know what you want. Because I want to do your will, not my will. So one time, I was taking some habang nagpintayo, waiting for the Lord to do something. I took some classes in Mahadi. I took some master level courses in the seminary there, at the Asian Seminary for Christian Ministries. And my professor, one of my professors, became a good friend. Him and his wife became a good friend. And he wrote a book. He's very prophetic. His name is Dr. Dan Kapiner. And, you know, Shepra, a little bit starstruck. He's my professor, but he also is an author. So we all, all of the students bought his book and wants him to autograph it. So he said, Dr. Dan, could you please autograph you with him in? And he said, okay, but it will take some time because what I do is I listen to the Holy Spirit first and then I'll put that, I won't just write my name or a Bible verse there. I will actually write down what I believe the Holy Spirit is telling me for you in the book. So he did that. I sat down back in the classroom. I sat down in my seat. I opened it up. And it said, I put, I put something in your heart. Go ahead and do it. And that was the green light to start Luka. That was the Lord saying, okay, now. Now's the time, right now. 
And then you saw the, the journey that we've been going on. Clarence came in in 2000. I've known Clarence for 23 years now. And I remember when he first came in, he wasn't, I don't remember you having any hair back then, bro. <laughs> Did you? Really? Okay. Okay. If let's agree, you had hair and I was Payat. Every day, by faith. <laughs> let's rewrite history. But I remember it wasn't Clarence that I met first. It was Linda. Because he had come. I think Leo was preaching at the time. Yeah. And we were in a bar. We were in the Studio One bar. Festival Supermodel in Europa. And Clarence came from, he came from San Pedro on the bus, he came to watch a movie, because the movie theaters was on the next floor above the bar. He heard the music playing in the church, and he was asked, he wondered, oh, may live music on a Sunday? How can may live music on a Sunday? Usually the bar is open Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, not Sunday. Especially Sunday Sahapon. So he walked in <clears throat> and he sat down and Leo was preaching. And he goes, Abba, my stand up comedy Dito <laughs> on Sunday. The story goes, he went back home and told Linda, Linda, I'm the church Dito Sabar Festival Mall. And with Linda, so he sent his wife <laughs> to check us out. And I remember Linda sitting there. I think you brought a friend with you, Linda. You, you, and you were sitting at the table and smiling the whole time. For how many weeks? Three weeks yata? Three or four weeks yata? She was attending and then finally Clarence shows up. I guess Linda said, it's okay, but I'm safe though. <laughs> so he came. And then we, during that time, we had a tradition. I had a policy. The policy will get it done. If you will attend Newcom for three Sundays in a row, right? For three Sundays in a row, the next Sunday, so fourth Sunday, I will treat you to Starbucks. That was my, my policy back then. And three times in a row, see the Clarence and Celinda. So I had my assistant call her him up, I think it was at the Alice at the time. And called them up and said, Pastor Mark would like to meet you at the Starbucks at Festival Supermall on this day, if you're available on this day. And we met. And as they say, the rest is history. We became very close friends and we're still in touch, even though I moved back to Canada. And even though it's been many, many years later, many, many pounds later, many, many hair follicles later, we're still friends and we love each other. And I and what's amazing to me is that. I have known Newcom people, Leo, Joanne, Clarence, Linda, Reggie, Kim, everybody else, even Roxila, Roland, all these guys, all of the people that you see helping and doing here. I've known these guys longer than I know any of my elementary school classmates, any of my high school classmates. I've known them longer, and I never thought that I would have friendships that last that long. It really is a happening. Not too long ago, you know, I could go on and on and on, but you know what? I was invited here to actually give you a word from the Lord, so I want to share that with you. Not too long ago, in December, December 8, 2022, our eldest daughter got married. Right? So you're wondering. I know some of you are thinking, well, how old are you really, Pastor Mark? Leo is older than me. Let me let me set that standard by eight years. So I'm actually 55, and my daughter, our daughter, is 29 years old. She just turned 29 last August, and she met a, a man earlier that year, and then they quickly got engaged and got married on December 8th. On that, that day when they were planning to get married, they asked me, they sat down with me and they said, Daddy, we have to ask you something. I said, what's, what's up? And she said, we want to ask you if you will be the one to marry us. 
I said I'd be through. I, I, okay, let me think about it. Yes. Yes. Because it's been my dream to walk my daughter down the aisle. That's, that's what I'm living for. That's what, I need to extend my life. I make, make sure that I don't die before I walk my daughters down the aisle. And I knew I could do that. I was going to do that on December 8th. But then they asked me, will you marry us? I said, wow, that's amazing. Then she said this, both of them, her husband's name is Andrew, and both of them said, we also have another favor. Would you please MC our wedding reception? I said, wow. I thought about it, and I said, okay, I'll do it. I will walk you down the aisle. I will do the ceremony. I will MC your reception. I will do all that, but there is one thing I will not do because I have standards. There's, some, there's one thing I will not do, and that is, I will not be the stripper at your bridal shower. I have standards. So thank God there was no such thing anyways in the bridal shower. But I only say that because in the States and in Canada, they're very, it's very common during, you know, it's your last night of being a single, right? Last night of being a bachelor. So of course they have a stripper or somebody sexy dancing. I said, that doesn't sound right to me. And I didn't want to do that anyways. You can't handle this sex. You can't handle it. You can't. All right. <laughs> that brought a lot of change because a couple of years before, before Ariel got married, our youngest daughter, Vicky, who is uh, 25 years old, decided that she, she wanted to, to live outside of our home. She wanted to have her own place. So she moved out of our house. Because our youngest daughter works in film and television. She's an assistant director and a production assistant. And she's probably worked on some things that you may have seen if you watch on Netflix or like She's done movies that are on that. And it's hard for her from our house to go to the different studios and the different locations because we only have one bus that passes by our house for every day. So for her, she decided, I'm gonna move out and I'll have my own apartment, my own place, which is closer to many buses so I can commute. So she did that. And so now that our eldest daughter got married, you know, now we're gonna be empty nesters. Beth and I will be alone in our home. And our house is not big, it's a town home. It's a three bedroom, two bathroom town home. It's, but, but it has five floors, right? The, the bedroom is at the very top. The, all three bedrooms at the very top with both bathrooms. The second, the next floor down, which we call the mezzanine, that's where the kitchen and the dining area are. The next floor down, that's the living room. It has a high ceiling living room. Beautiful place, but small. And then the next floor is the entrance hall. The next floor is a finished basement, and further down underground is where the furnace is and where the laundry room is. So every time we have to do laundry, we have to go all the way up and all the way down and then all the way. And if you forget something, I am a hulu Oh my gosh, I gotta go all the way down, all the way up. And that's why sexy, sexy, quite cool. Because going up and down. Now, that's too much for us now. We're getting old, too old to do that. There have been a couple of times where I've actually fallen down the stairs. You know, everybody's worried about me and everything. And so we're thinking, what now? Life is changing. All of these events in our life is changing the way we live. It's changing our experience. How or not? Maslada COVID. Right? Three years ago, something happened in the world that changed everything. It changed your life. It changed my life. And everything's not the same anymore. Some of you are still wearing masks, right? And not, not a problem with that. In Canada, if you walk into a hospital, you have to wear a mask. If you walk into a medical clinic, you have to wear a mask. If you're going to go to the dentist, you have to wear a mask. We wear a mask when, when it's absolutely necessary, if we feel sick or we feel there are people around us who are sick, and especially if we're going to be around people who are old, we wear a mask. 
right? It's a different world now, though, because we never used to do that before. And sometimes it's hard to remember to do that. Like today, coming here, I didn't. I forgot my mask. My mask is sitting in the table in our in the place where we're staying right now. I said, oh, forgot about it. What can I do? Right? Things are different now. And the impact of the changes that happen, that are happening in the world has had a major impact on our way of life. Businesses have shut down because of that. Certain restaurants and places here that we thought, oh, where's that now? It shut down during COVID. Same thing happening in Canada. You know what, in 2021, Starbucks announced that they're gonna close 400 Starbucks coffee shops in North America. 200 of them were in Canada, 200 in the United States, right? That changed everything. So all the old Starbucks places where I used to go, they're no longer there where we live. They've shut that down. Some of the stores no longer do. And then they even changed some of the restaurants. They don't, for some reason, they don't serve soup because of COVID. Oh, Subway doesn't serve any of the soup. Tomato soup, broccoli, broccoli cheese. They don't serve any of that anymore. Why? Because of COVID. Oh, what happened to the clam chowder? No, no more because of COVID. I don't get it. What's happening? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if that happened in the Philippines and you could never, never, you would never be able to go out anymore and buy bulalo or eat sinigang? Can you imagine that? Because of COVID. Lots of changes have happened. The question is, how do we deal with these changes? And it's not easy dealing with these changes. Whether they're personal changes that happen in our life, like our, our Children moving out, and now we're empty nest. Or COVID shuts down, and now you can't go to work, or you lost your job because of it. Now what? What do we do when that happens? That is the biggest challenge. Now, when we went back to Canada, and I retired from being a pastor in 2017, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what? am I gonna do now? If you don't want me, because it was the Lord that spoke to me and he said, I want you to step down because I have a different vision for you. And so I said, Lord, okay, I'm gonna obey. It took me one year to obey. My obedience to the Lord was delayed. How many of you know that delayed obedience is still disobedience? Delayed obedience is disobedience. When the Lord tells you to do something, you do it a God. But when you delay, I, Lord, next time, next time, next month, next month, next year, that's disobedience. When I did that, I actually tried to obey right away, and I resigned from the ministries I was handling. But the people, my people that I reported to, my leaders said, no, we can't let you resign. We need you in this position. Three times I had to give my resignation letter. The first two times they said, no. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna obey my leaders. They don't think it's time. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe my timing is wrong. No, I, okay, I'll stay, I'll stay. But you know what happened? When you find yourself in disobedience, when you find yourself delaying the obedience that God has called you to, everything changes in your life. The circumstance of your life, all of a sudden, weird things begin to happen. Things that you, we lost friendships, we lost relations that we had known for decades. For what reason? There was no reason. We couldn't, we still to this day don't even understand it. The only reason I can say to my wife and myself is that because of that delayed disobedience, this is the result of that. We lost friendships and we lost opportunities and we lost certain things that were what we thought was going to happen, these expectations that didn't happen for our life because of delayed disobedience. So finally, the third time after about a year, the third time I gave in my resignation letter and I said, this is an irrevocable resignation. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you do to me. I cannot go on. I need to obey the Lord. I can't allow this to continue to destroy my life. And that settled it. That was done. And the Lord opened up an opportunity for me to do something else. He said, what do you do after pastoring? Because when you think about it, what kind of skills do you have as a pastor? What kind of skills can you use in the marketplace as a pastor? 
I never built anything as a pastor. I never built a stage or built a house or anything like that. I never, you know, I what I, I never. Um, I, did it. I hated administration, that's why I had people on my team who did all the administration for the church. I'm not going to deal with what can I do? I can get up and I can speak. I can get up and train people. I can teach. I can make people laugh sometimes. I can joke. I can, I can communicate. That's about it. I can analyze. I can think and analyze and take something that's very complicated and make it very simple. I can do that. And I thought, none of those skills are good out there. Nobody is looking to hire somebody who can do those things. The only people who hire people who know how to do that is church. So I thought to myself, you know what? I have no hope. I can't get a job. How can I get a job if I don't have any marketable skills to use? I thought, wow. Until an opening came up, and I was asked to join a company that was a financial services company that sold insurance. And I said, okay, let's see where this is going. I don't know what's going on. When I joined the company, shortly, months after that, they asked me to teach. They said, could you teach the licensing program in our company for the students who want to become licensed brokers. I said, yeah, I can do that. Why not? So I studied the material, I started my classes, and things started going well. To the point that a month and a half after I started teaching that, the CEO of the company came to me, met me, and said, Queer Mark, would you please come on board full-time, not just part-time, and not only that, I want you to go around the country and train our staff and train our advisors. I want you to train them on how to communicate properly. So I, I wrote a course called Mastering Public Speaking, and this company paid for my airfare, my hotels, my dinners, all of that, so that I could travel to all of the offices in Canada to train these people. I met, I met thousands of people that I were able to meet in different parts. I saw Canada for the first time. I grew up in Canada but I never actually traveled around that, and for the first time I saw the blueberries in Saskatchewan, I saw the mountains and the oceans in British Columbia, I saw the flatlands of Alberta, and I went to the eastmost furthest point in North America, in St. John, Newfoundland. You know, I stood there on the edge, the water was there, the ocean, Atlantic Ocean is there, and there's a sign that says the easternmost edge of North America, of both Canada and the United States, easternmost edge. Next stop, you know it has a sign? Next stop, Portugal, Iceland. That's the next stop, because that's how far east we were. I was like, I've never been there before. I said, wow, this is the best job I've ever had. Not including ministry, but it's the best job I ever had. They pay me to travel, they pay me to talk, they pay me to train. They pay my hotels and everything. Oh my gosh, this is the perfect job. And I did that for almost three years. And it, I was asking the Lord, Lord, could this be that vision? You said you have a bigger vision for me, bigger than just handling the congregation, having maybe a national kind of impact in Canada. Could this be? And I pursued that. And to this day, I'm still a licensed financial advisor. Okay, that's what, I, what's, that's what I do, right, to pay the bills and to, to this, this is what I'm trying to do. But I'm what's known as a kingdompreneur. A kingdompreneur is a committed follower of Jesus Christ who has a mission to go into the marketplace and bring the gospel into the marketplace. This is, what, this is why I agree to it. I've never agreed just to make money. That's not my goal, is just to make money. I told that to my leaders in the business and they said, they're kind of frustrated at me because they're always trying to entice, hey, if you do this, Mark, I'll give you a $50 gift card from Amazon. 50 to keep your gift card. I don't care about that stuff. It frustrates them because they can't dangle the carrot and make me do what they want me to do, right? Because I know that I have a mission for the world. How do we respond? In that industry, so many people actually shut down their insurance business. Some people left the business, some people gave up their licenses, some people sold off some parts of their business 
when COVID started. And they thought, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to make any money during this time in COVID. It's, what we did instead was I started training people online for the first time. Nobody knew how to do that in our business. So I learned how to do Zoom. I learned how to do keynote and presentations on, on Zoom and connecting people and bringing people together. And I had large classes online. I had 100, 200, 300 people just wanting to learn how to do the business from me online. They were all over the place. They were all over Canada. I didn't have to travel anymore. I didn't have to get on a plane. I didn't have to leave my family. I could just wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, you know, not even take a shower. Just hilab us a little bit, brush the hair, and I could wear sh I could wear my boxer shorts under here with a shirt, a collared shirt on top that looks like I'm ready to go for business and just relax and then do the training. And it was so much fun during that time. I missed the traveling with them. But everyone thought that this was the end of business. This was the end of life as we know it. So how do we deal with that? Especially for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, how do we deal with the changes that, that are demanded by things like COVID or things like the things that change in our life? You know, it's amazing to me what's happened here. You know, when I see the dancing and everything, I remember those days. I was telling Joanne the other day, I said, in the early days of Newcom, we were the dancers. We danced. Me, I remember Clarence. We were in the bar at Studio One. And I remember him getting up there and doing his whole thing. And it's like, wow, cool. And I used to, I used to dance too. Now, we didn't dance like the dancers here. We didn't do presentation. We were just dancing before the work. And, but we did everything. When we first started Nucom, it was me and Leo with our shorts and our sando, and we're doing all the equipment, and we're setting up all the equipment in the first restaurant along uh, Tim, along Thomas Pura, oh, Timo. Process, process, hey, process, Avenue, uh, here in Kansas City. And it's like, that was those days. And now we have teams that do this. And it's amazing. And you know the thing that amazes me the most? What amazes me the most is not how good the dancers are, because they're good. I mean, every generation amazing, right? I'm talking about from the young kids to the older ladies to to newcom beat. All of these guys, so good. So I'm so proud. You all can remember. I'm so proud of of what you've been able to do when you become. But you know what? What I'm even more proud of. I'm more proud of the fact that all of these moves and all of this production is just a shell of what Newcom is, because what Newcom really is, is the work of God in your life. The transformation. My God, if the gene can find a boyfriend, God is alive and miracles can happen. Yeah. I mean, I mean if, if people can get healed of cancer, if we're experiencing that, there was a time, I don't know if you know this, but there was a time when the hearts of your leaders, the hearts of Leo, Joanne, and Kim, and Reggie, and all these guys, their hearts crying out for this church. Why is this happening to us? Why? Because there used to be a lot of problems. And probably there's still some problems in the church. A lot of problems in the families, yes. But what they didn't understand, you know, there was a time where when they said, oh, the youth, they're not responding. We wish they were more on fire for God, blah, 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 blah. And now you look at them. Now you see what God is doing in their life. You never know. You never know. That's why you never give up. Because you never know what God is doing. Maybe on the surface, everything in your, the circumstances of your life look like they're nothing, look like they're crap, look like they're ah. Oh my gosh, whatever. But God is doing something underneath. God is doing something invisible in your heart, in your life. And then when the right time comes, healing comes. When the right time comes, transformation. When the right time comes, boyfriend, fiance, husband. When the right time comes. So what we need to do, my message to you today, and I've got more actually, I've got slides that I'm gonna show you, but, and I'm gonna go through them quickly, but, what you have to, the main thing I want you to remember is this. 
It doesn't matter what season in your life you're in, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what season in your life. You might be in a season of preparation. You might be in a season of waiting. Okay? It doesn't matter what season you're in. God is in control. He's in control. He's doing something invisible and underneath the circumstances of your life. Something good is going to happen in your life. But right now, maybe right now you don't see it, but that's okay. It's not because there's something wrong. It's because it's not yet the season for you to see. Because God is a God of seasons. Let's see if I can open this again. Keep opening it and it shuts down. Here we go. God is a God of seasons. Our first and most important step to remember when these changes happen in our life is to remember who God is. We have to remember that God is good. Right? He's good. He, he, God, in the essence, of the very heart of God, God is good. His love is good. His mercy is good. That means every thought that He has and every act that He does in your life, every act that you can see and every act that you cannot see, it's always for your good. Because He is good. Not only that, remember... <coughs> That his love endures forever. His love endures forever. There will never be a moment. There will, be not, there will never be a thing that you could ever do to make God not love you anymore. Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. The worst thing you can think of. That will never make God love you any less because his love endures Ever. Remember this too, that God is faithful. His faithfulness is great. Leah talked about loyalty. God is more loyal to you than you are loyal to Him. You might give up, you might slip, you might let go, but He will never let go of you. You may let go of God, you may let go of your faith, but He will, ne he will never let go of His faith in you, of His belief in you, of His hope for you, of His love for you because his faithfulness is great. And remember that his mercies are new every morning. You had a bad day? So you had a bad day. That's okay. Because tomorrow is a new day. And tomorrow his mercies are new. Every morning his mercies are new. New mercies every single morning. Now, I want you to take a look at a passage, a key passage here, Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, where it says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. I want you to remember that. He changes times and seasons. Say it with me. He changes times and seasons. Say it again. He changes times and seasons. Say it one more time. He changes times and seasons. So God changes. He's the one in control. He's the one, you know, here in the Philippines, we have two seasons, wet and dry. It's always hot, but it's either wet or it's dry. It's God, he says, oh, it's time, wet season. Right? Then he goes, oh, it's time, dry season. He's the one that's in control. He's the one that's in control of the seasons. Now in Canada, we have four seasons. We have winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you got to do is go. Right? We have all those four seasons. Because right now it's winter. It's God who changes the dial. It's God who changes the seasons. Winter now. Spring next. Summer next. Fall next. He's the one that changes. God is a God of seasons, and this is so important. If we don't understand that God is a God of seasons, we will never understand how life truly works. Now, what does it mean that God is a God of seasons? It means this. Underlying all of the changes in our lives, there lives a God who is in control of what those changes will produce. You don't know what's going to happen. Beth and I don't know what's going to happen once Ariel and Andrew leave our house. They're living with us for a few months. 
and then they're planning to move about an hour north of us in a place called Newmarket. We don't know what that's going to do. We don't know. We don't know how that's going to affect us. I, 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 I asked Beth, I said to her, are you ready? It's just you and me. It's just you and me. You might get bored with me. You might want to change me. Maybe you should have said something different. You know, are you sure you should have said yes to me? Maybe, maybe you'll change your mind. And she goes, never, I'll never change my mind. I know my mind is made up. My mind is made up. I'm stuck with it. No, I mean, I, I'm with her the whole time because I choose to be with her. She's stuck with me because I'll never leave. I'll never leave. And so changes might happen in our lives, but if God is a God of seasons, he knows what those changes are. He knows what those changes are going to be even before you know it. He knows what's going to happen with your family. He's know, he knows what's going to happen with your job. He knows what's, what, what's going to happen with this community. He knows. You think it surprises him? It doesn't surprise him. But he's also at work. He's at work in your life. And that's what it means for God to be God of season. And we need to understand what season are you in? What season are you in? I want you to turn to the person on your left and you ask them, look them straight in the eye and say, what season are you in? Yeah, go ahead. What season are you in? Let me show you another verse of scripture. First Chronicles chapter two, verse chapter twelve, verse thirty-two. Here on the screen, it says, "From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, two hundred chiefs with all their relatives under their command." Now, let me give you some context, real quickly here. This verse is part of a bigger chapter that lists all the people that come from different tribes. Now, why did he do that? Because there, what was happening was God was raising up David to be the king of Israel and replace Saul. In other words, there was a shift in government. Right? Are you familiar with shifts in government? Yes. Right? It wasn't an election, right? But it's something like that. And some people wanted Saul. Other people wanted David. Right? And God was doing something and this list, in this chapter, was a list of all the people who were defecting from Saul, King Saul, to David. So we're going to join David because we know that David is God's man for the times. He, God is appointing David. Saul is corrupt. Saul is not God's man anymore. And so now it's time to align yourself with the anointed king. This is why, this is what happened. And there's a group of people from the tribe of Issachar who were very unique. And what that verse, this verse here, <coughs> in 1 Chronicles 32, 12, 32, says these men from Issachar understood the times and knew what to do. They understood the season. They knew the big picture. They saw and understood what God was trying to do. And what season, they were in a season of change, they were in a season of transition. God wanted David to be king. They knew that that was his will, and they knew that this was going to happen. And so because they understood the times, because they understood the season, they knew what to do. This is our problem. Why is it that we have such a problem with COVID two and a half years ago? Because everything changed. And the reason why that was so upsetting, not only did we lose, there were people that we loved that we lost during COVID. There were, there were jobs and businesses that were lost because of COVID. There were people, I know people, who had to watch their elderly parents die, separated by a window because they were not allowed to be with that elderly parent because of COVID, right? Why is this all happening? And we get upset, and rightly so, we get upset. But the main reason why we get upset during those times when things change is because we don't understand the season we're in. We don't understand what's going on 
Why are we going through this? And that's really the question that we asked Hogan during that time. Why? Fuck it, Lord. Why us? Why did this happen to us? Why did that happen to Nanai? Why did that happen to Bunso? Why did we have to go through that? Lord, why did we have to lose our business? Why did we have to go through that? That's right, we ask that, don't we? We wonder. What did I do to have this judgment? Lord, that's not judgment. That's not ju the reason why you think it's judgment, that's the first thing we fall to. We think there's something wrong with us. When in reality, it's not that you did something wrong. It's that in your life, the season is changing. And you need to understand that. If you don't understand what season you're in, you're going to be confused, and you're going to be anxious, and you're going to be discouraged. So you need to understand. I want you to understand what season you're in. We need to understand the season we're in so that we know, like the man of Issachar, we know what to do in those times. If you know your season, you can adjust what you do. You can adjust your activity. Proverbs 20, verse 4. Let's throw that up there the next slide. Proverbs 20, verse 4 says, Sluggards do not plow in season. So at harvest time, they look but find nothing. What's a sluggard? A sluggard is a lazy person. You know, here we characterize it one tamar. Doesn't want to do anything. Sluggards, it's the time. It's time, right? It says, sluggards do not plow. In other words, it's time to plow the ground and put the seed in, but they're so lazy, they don't do it. They don't understand that this is the season to do it. So what happens? Later on, when all of the other farms and all of the other people, all of their friends, are reaping the benefits, are getting paid and getting a harvest. They're out there looking for because you did not act properly during the season that you were supposed to act. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, what I'm saying? Yeah. When you understand the season you're in, you understand what you should be doing. But if you don't understand the season you're in, you might be doing something against yourself. And then you're going to look for hope. You're going to look for profit. You're going to look for something to help you during the time of harvest. But there's nothing there. Why? Because you didn't understand the season you were in before. Second thing. Second truth. If you know your season, you can align your expectations. What can I expect to happen here? Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time. Did you catch that? At the proper time. Four words, say it with me. At the proper time. Again, at the proper time. What's going to happen at the proper time? What's going to happen? We will reap a harvest. We'll reap a harvest. How many of you want to reap a harvest? I know my, many of you here are not farmers. What do we mean by harvest? We want to prosper. Right? We want to see our children become stable. Financially and emotionally and relationally. Right? We want to see these new, these new relationships, these new romances bearing fruit. Boy or girl. Boys or girls. Right? That's fruitful. That's a harvest. We want to see our businesses prosper. We want to see us make a profit. We want to be able to take care of all the employees that work under us. We want to be able to take care of them. That's a harvest. Right? When will we have a harvest? As long as we do not give up, don't become tired of doing the right thing. Because at the right time, at the proper time, What's going to happen? You will reap a harvest, but if we do not, what? If we don't give up. Sometimes people give up right before the breakthrough. Right? They give up just before God is about to do a miracle in your life. Don't give up. Understand the time, the season that you are in. Understand it 
So you can manage your expectations. What can I expect here? If I'm in a season of preparation, if I'm in a season of soap, if I'm in a season of cultivation, I'm not going to expect to get a harvest yet. It's like there's a saying in our industry, in the, in the industry that I work in now, financial, in finances, you cannot expect to make a profit on the same day that you make a deposit. You know, you know what I'm saying? You can't expect the, the you can't expect to eat mango if you only planted the mango seed yesterday. Hello, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes, sir. It takes time. It takes patience, but it takes wise activity. Make sure that you plant that seed. You know, you know. Could you imagine? What would you think if you walked in here next Sunday? And you saw Puyaleo, you know, trying to plant, you know, putting some, some onion seed here, some potatoes, and some mangoes in this corner here. You think, something's going wrong. What's he trying to do? Why is he planting a farm here in the family hall? This is not where it goes, right? Malet! How about Malet, right? He's wrong! Wrong place, wrong place, wrong time, wrong scene, right? So no matter how, and what if, what if Leo does that? I said, I'm doing it by faith. And then he goes, every day he comes here every morning, and he lays hands on the seed. I come, I call forth growth. I call forth, I don't want to get at it. What? No, I Leo. That's crazy! No matter how much you pray and fast, nothing's gonna happen if you're planting the seed on top of the tile. In this place. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong seed. Not the right place. What well, needs to happen? You need to know what season you're in. When you know what season you're in, it tells you what you're supposed to do. But then it also tells you what you should expect during that season. See, means son. For example, let me give you a real world example. Sometimes, sometimes for example, let's say Bejean and Rainer, right? They'll get married this year. In our culture, once they get married, you're, everyone's going to expect, oh, my baby, not back. My baby, not back. But I will say this to you. Don't give them that pressure. It might not be the season for them. You know what I mean? It might not be the seed. It might not be the right time for Eugene and Rainer to start having children right away. I know we're very, we're very big on honeymoon baby, honeymoon baby, but that might not be the right season. My baby later. Some of you, some of you, I know some of you struggle. For example, when you got married, you didn't have any kids. You're trying to have kids, and it was so hard to have kids, and you're wondering what's going on. What's going on? Is something wrong? Did we do something wrong? Is is there something biologically wrong? So you look into all of that, and you find out there's really no problem. There is no problem. But why? You know why? Because God knows what the season is. God knows what season you're in. And He knows His plans for you. The circumstances might be cause you anxiety on the outside, but understand that underneath and behind those circumstances, God is in control. And God is at work. Keep doing the right thing. Do not become weary in doing good. Don't ever give up. Keep going because at the right time, the proper time, you will be harvest. So here's the question. So you might be wondering, okay, Pastor Mark, I agree. I need to know what season am I in. How can I know what season am I in? Next slide, please. There are six seasons in life. Okay? There is six seasons. I know it's kind of small, but if you can see it, if you take a picture of it, that would be good. It'll be very good for your discussion later. The season of preparation, that's the first one. The season of preparation. Second, the season of cultivation. So the season of preparation is when a farmer has to gather his tools. When a farmer knows what part of the farm is he, or the land that he's going to plant. Season of preparation, maybe he has to buy a plot of land first. Season of preparation, preparing his family. Season of preparation, buying the right equipment and buying the seed. 
Okay, that's preparation. All of that is preparation. Second season is the season of cultivation. What's cultivation? Cultivation is when the farmer goes and he breaks up the soil. You don't just throw seed on the ground. You have to break up the soil, use a plow, right? This time you have a kalaba, uh, right? That pulls that plow. And it breaks up the soil so that the seed can grow inside. The sun, mashad matigas, in soil, right? So you have to break that up. That's why the so that's why the farm that Leo wants to plant in the corner here will never happen. Why? Because it's tile and cement. The seed can't go in. It can't be nourished. You have to bring it out to the soil. And even then, when the soil is there, mashad matigas, so you have to bring it up. That's cultivation. Then there's also the season of sowing. That's when you plant the seed. That's when you plant the seed. The farmer then takes the seed and puts it in the soil that he just plowed. Then after the sowing, there is the season of waiting. You can't expect the, the, the fruit to grow right away. There is a waiting period. There's a season for it to grow. And you have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. That's why being a farmer, you have to have a lot of faith. A real farmer, whether you're planting rice or corn or vegetables, a true farmer, he knows that God is in control. He knows he's not in control of his harvest. He knows that the Lord is in control of his harvest. He exercises faith every day. He exercises faith every day when he's waiting, waiting and waiting to see when the sprouts will come up. Weeks and weeks. He believes. You know why? He believes in the power of the seed. He believes in the power of God to do what needs to happen in your life. When you're in that season, when you're in a season of waiting, you have to believe that the seed that was planted in you is good seed, and it will do good fruit. Okay? Then there is the season of reaping. Once you waited, and the growth has come, now it's time to harvest. That's reaping. The season of harvest or the season of reaping. That's when you, you take all the fruit, you bring it in, and you bring it into the storehouse. Wow! Now you're ready to sell that. You've got a lot of great harvest that you can sell, which then goes to the last season, which is the season of preservation. When you reap a harvest, some of it you keep for yourself, some of it you sell. You have to preserve it. You have to make sure that what you got there will continue to go. Because farmers, they only have one season of harvest. How many seasons of harvest are there in a year? Salam, Two. Salam. Two? And the Philippines. Like for what? Rice. For rice. How about for tomatoes? How about for corn? How about for so okay, let's say there's there's one or two seasons of harvest in Philippines, depending on what you're growing. Right? That harvest has to last you. The money you get from that harvest, the profit you get from that harvest has to last you until the next harvest. And if you're wise, you set aside a little bit as an emergency just in case that next harvest doesn't make it. Smart and wise farmer will do that. That's what preservation is about. And in our lives, these seasons are true for all of our lives. Think about it. From when you're born, from age five, kindergarten, all the way to when you go to college, that's the season of preparation. It's a season of preparation and education, right? And then when you when you graduate, you get your first job. You're not going to be CEO right away. You're not going to be a, a manager right away. You're going to work your way up there. That's a season of cultivation, right? You're breaking up the fallow ground. And once you've done that, after a few years of working in a job that you know that's not going to be your final job. You start to sow seeds. You sow seeds in, in other industries or you sow seeds in the people that are above you who can promote you. And when those seeds become fruit, you're waiting and waiting and waiting, waiting for that seed to grow. You're thinking, when am I going to be promoted? When is this going to happen? Don't give up because at the proper time, the promotion will come. And then the harvest the reaping, the season of reaping coming, the season of harvest comes, you get that promotion. Or you start a new business on your own because you've learned so much from your experience in that job 
that you feel that you can serve a market that is not being served with products that are not being put out there, and you start your own business. When you start your own business, guess what season you're in? You go back to the beginning. You're in the season of preparation for your business. But you only got to the season of preparation because you went through the other seasons. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You know, when you, when, right now, for example, I like, I, I'm going to do this. Eugene and Rainier, they're in the season of what? Preparation. Because they just started that relationship. But how many of you know that, you know, in her story, they went through a lot before that. So they were going through this as friends. Rainier was in the friend zone for such a long time. But what did he do? He did what was right and what was good so that at the proper time, she said yes. As long as he didn't give up, at the proper time, good things happen. Now, they started a new level of their relationship. Where did they go? To the beginning, season of preparation. Now they gotta prepare. They gotta prepare not only for their wedding, but you they have to prepare for their long, lifelong relationship. When I married, when I, I've, I've done a couple of weddings before we came here. I did a wedding and then also my daughter's wedding. And this is what I counsel my, my the people that I married. I do not believe in long weddings. Right? If I do a wedding, my wedding ceremony lasts at the most. If it's a traditional Filipino with the cord and the veil and the communion and the candles and all that stuff, it lasts 45 minutes. If there's none of that, the last marriage that I did, wedding that I did, didn't have any of that. So I said, okay, we were done in 35 minutes. Okay, and I told him this, I don't believe in long weddings, but I believe in long marriages. Yeah. Wedding, it take you 15 minutes to say the I do's. Sign the papers, file them, and you're done in 15 minutes. But marriage lasts forever. And that's what your focus is. And that's what you prepare. Eugene, you listen to me? I'm specifically talking to you about this. Preparation. Season of preparation. Okay? Season of preparation. Don't jump to the season of harvest and fruitfulness right away. Right? Preparation. And finally, number three, if you know your season, you can exercise your faith if you know your season. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29 says, He also said, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man is scattered seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Did you hear that? He does not know how. Say that with me. He does not know how. One more time. He does not know how. The farmer gets out there, he's, he cultivates his land, he plants his seed, he goes to bed. Wakes up, takes a look, nothing happens, goes to bed again. Comes back the next day, checks, nothing. Weeks, he'll do that for weeks, maybe even months. Then finally something comes up. Does he know how that happened? No. No, he doesn't know how it happened. He just knows that's supposed to happen. But he doesn't know how. He can't explain to you what's happening in the sea. He can't explain to you what's happening under the soil. He can't explain that to you. Just like, can you explain how babies all of a sudden they have life? Can you? You can talk about the biologics of it. You can talk about the physiology of it. You can talk about the seed and, you know, sperm and the egg. You can talk about that. You can talk about the acts of reproduction. But really, can you really explain how does a baby get born with a soul? How does a baby, when, they, when, they, when they're born, have the characteristics of the dad and the mom? How is that? How do they do that? How is that? It's a mystery. He does not know how. We do not know how. When you plant your seed, when you know what season you're in, you will know whether you're in a season that you have to trust and you have to wait. And that's exercising faith. Some of you are in that season right now. Some of you are in a season of waiting. 
you've been waiting and waiting on something for God to, to do something. You've been, you've been wondering, why is this happening? And you probably actually, I don't know what I'm in. I don't know what I'm in. What do we still have to do? Can I say this to you guys? You probably don't have to do anything, and you probably don't have any sin. You're just in a season of waiting. And when you're in a season of waiting, it takes faith and it takes trust. So what's your prayer during the season of waiting? Lord, I will trust you. Lord, even if I do not see the results now, I will trust you that the results will be good. I'm in a season of waiting, Lord, and I will wait upon you, and I will trust you for the outcome. I will trust you for the result, because I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you can do that. Do you know what season you're in? Now when this COVID crisis hit our company, it felt like a lot of, you know, our company felt like a lot of other companies. We were caught off guard. We were caught unprepared. But we determined to prepare ourselves. We decided that if we can't see our clients face to face, we would learn how to do business online, non-face to face. You know why? We were in a new season. What happened in COVID? Here's what happened in COVID. God sovereignly shifted the planet to a new season almost immediately. March 2019, God said, new season. And that was a season of preparation. We didn't know what was the future. We didn't know. Some of us still don't know what that future is like because you're still in the season of preparation. Some of you have been preparing. You saw, you, you, you already reacted. You've already made your mistakes. But now you know basically what God wants you to do. And you're in a season of waiting because you planted some seed and now you're just waiting for that to happen. When you know what season you're in, you can exercise faith and you can be patient and trust God. For months, I trained our advisors almost every day on how to do their business on Zoom. I trained on how to do presentations, how to close, how to prospect, on how to settle policies. Six months after COVID hit, we became one of the best agencies in our industry in, in Canada. We produced more business than other agencies that were 10 times bigger than us. We started out unprepared in the beginning. But when we realized what season we were in, we got to work and God blessed us. Blue Calm Family, my word to you for 2023 is Know your season. Act according to your season. And trust God in the season you're in. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you.